Hello, greetings, and welcome to this online lecture. Our topic for today is about photosynthesis. Now, I'm sure you are aware that cells get their nutrients from their environment. But the question is, where do these nutrients come from? Now, virtually all organic material here on Earth has been produced by cells that convert energy from the sun into energy containing macromolecules. This process called photosynthesis is essential to the global carbon oxygen cycle and organisms that conduct photosynthesis represents the lowest level in most food chains in our ecosystems. Now, most living things depend on photosynthetic cells to manufacture the complex organic molecules they require as a source of energy. Photosynthetic cells are quite diverse and they include cells found in green plants, phytoplanktons, and cyanobacteria. Now, during the process of photosynthesis, cells make use of carbon dioxide and energy from the sun to make sugar molecules and oxygen. These sugar molecules are the basis for more complex molecules made by the photosynthetic cells such as glucose. Then, via cellular respiration, cells make use of oxygen and glucose to synthesize energy-rich carrier molecules such as ATP or adenosine triphosphate and carbon dioxide is produced as a waste product. Alright, so let's take a look at this PowerPoint slide wherein it shows the general formula for photosynthesis. So we have here carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and oxygen absorbed uh, from the soil by the roots combines with the help of light energy from the sun. The products are the following. So we have sugar, C6H12O6 and oxygen is released as a waste gas. So plants are the only photosynthetic organisms to have leaves and a leaf can be considered as a solar collector. So isn't that fascinating that a leaf can harness the sun's energy to manufacture food? A leaf is crammed and full of these photosynthetic cells. Now, the raw materials for photosynthesis includes the following. So you have water from the soil that was absorbed by the plants via the roots and carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide enters the plant via openings called stomata. And the products of photosynthesis include sugar and oxygen. The oxygen is considered as a waste gas and exits the leaf. So, isn't that fascinating indeed? Now, before we go into the details of the biochemistry behind photosynthesis, I guess we need first to understand the nature of light. Now, there are several theories that explains the nature of light. One was given by Sir Isaac Newton when he mentioned that light is composed of particles, which we now call the corpuscular theory. Then we have the idea that light is in the form of a wave. And we will capitalize on this in our discussion of photosynthesis. There is another idea that light is composed of packets of energy called photons. So we will go into that later. But first, let's try to zoom in on this idea that light is in the form of a wave. Now, a wave is composed of the highest peak which we call as the peak. And the lowest point of the wave is called the throw. Now, the distance from one peak to the next peak or from one throw to the next throw is called a wavelength. A wavelength is defined as the distance from one peak to the next peak or one throw to the next throw. Now, this is important in our understanding of photosynthesis because the wavelength determines the amount of energy. 
Now, the energy of the wave is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So, that means that the longer the wavelength of light, it contains less energy than a light which has a shorter wavelength. Alright? So, the longer the wavelength, the lower is the energy compared to a wavelength that is shorter which contains higher energy. Now we know that the sun emits different forms of energy. And this is expressed in a diagram called the electromagnetic spectrum. Now the electromagnetic spectrum of the sun as you could see here has the following types of radiation. So first we have gamma rays. Now, if you will notice, gamma rays, they have very short wavelengths. So, that means gamma rays, they have the highest amount of energy in our electromagnetic spectrum. Then, this is followed by X-rays. X-rays has also a very short wavelength and highly penetrating. That's why X-rays are used in diagnostics. Then, this is followed by UV rays or ultraviolet rays. Then we have this narrow window in our electromagnetic spectrum, which is visible light. Then uh, beyond visible light, we have infrared radiation, then microwaves, and radio waves. Now you have to take note that our eyes, they are only sensitive to this narrow window in our electromagnetic spectrum, which is visible light. The other types of radiation like gamma rays, x-rays, microwaves, UV rays, they are not sensitive to the human eye so they are invisible to us. We can only perceive that narrow window in the electromagnetic spectrum which is visible light. And if you will recall, Isaac Newton performed an experiment wherein he allowed white light to pass through a prism or a triangular glass. And that white light was separated into different colors. Now, each color has its own electromagnetic spectrum or wavelength signature. Now, let's take a look at visible light and the colors that makes up visible light. Now, here is a diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum of the visible light range. Now, look closely at the violet region of visible light. So, you will notice that the violet region has the shortest wavelength. So, that means that violet has the highest amount of energy. Then, this is followed by indigo, then blue, then green orange yellow then red if you will notice that red has the longest wavelength so that means that the red portion of the electromagnetic spectrum of the visible light region has the lowest amount of energy so violet has the highest amount of energy while red has the lowest amount of energy so you have to take note that the shorter the wavelength, the higher is the energy. And the longer the wavelength, the lower is the energy. So that is the electromagnetic spectrum of the visible light range. Now at this point, let us now study the pigment necessary for photosynthesis. And we know that that pigment is chlorophyll. Now, before we go into the details of the chlorophyll molecule, let's first define what a pigment is. Now, a pigment is any substance that absorbs light. Now, pigments may come in different colors. Now, what determines the color of the pigment? Now, the color of the pigment comes from the wavelengths of light reflected. Now, let's take a look at chlorophyll. Now, we know that chlorophyll is a green pigment. Now, chlorophyll being a green pigment absorbs all of the wavelengths of visible light except green. Take note, except green, which is reflected to and is detected by our eyes. That's why we see chlorophyll as a green pigment. Now, what about the other colors of the pigment like black or white? 
Now, black pigments absorbs all of the wavelengths that strikes them. Now, white pigments, on the other hand, reflects all or almost all of the energy striking them. So, take note, chlorophyll, being a green pigment, absorbs most of the energy from the sun except green. Green is reflected back and it is detected by our eyes. Or let's take this apple. This apple absorbs most of the wavelengths of visible light except red. Red is reflected back and it is detected by our eyes. That's why we see this as a red apple. So that is chlorophyll as a pigment. Now, being a green pigment, chlorophyll absorbs most of the wavelengths of visible light except green. Green is reflected back as you could see in this illustration and it is detected by our eyes. That's why we see chlorophyll as a green pigment. Alright, now there are several types of chlorophyll. We have chlorophyll A that absorbs indigo and red lights. Then we have chlorophyll B that absorbs blue and orange red light. And we have chlorophyll C that absorbs blue and orange in smaller amounts. Now let's take a look at the so-called absorption spectrum of the chlorophyll molecule. Now each color in the visible light range has a characteristic absorption spectrum describing how it absorbs or reflects different wavelengths of light. Wavelengths absorbed by chlorophyll and other photosynthetic pigments generate electrons to power photosynthesis and we will go to that later. All photosynthetic organisms have chlorophyll A which absorbs violet blue and reddish orange red wavelengths of light. Chlorophyll A reflects green and yellow green wavelengths as you can see in this diagram of the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll. And accessory photosynthetic pigments including chlorophyll B and chlorophyll C absorbs energy that chlorophyll A does not absorb. Chlorophyll only triggers a chemical reaction when it is associated with proteins embedded in a membrane and that's the thylakoid membrane that we will be mentioning later as we study photosynthesis. So that is the so-called absorption spectrum of the chlorophyll molecule. So before we go into the details of the biochemistry behind photosynthesis, let's take a look now at the organelle responsible for photosynthesis. And that organelle is the chloroplast. Now the chloroplast is similar to the mitochondria in several ways. The chloroplast is a double membraned organelle similar to the mitochondria. The chloroplast has an outer membrane and an inner membrane similar to the mitochondria. And inside the chloroplast are flattened membranes called thylakoids. The thylakoid contains the green pigment chlorophyll. Now inside the chloroplast, these thylakoids they are placed on top of one another or we can say they are stacked uh, to one another like stacks of pancakes. And these structures are called grana. So a granum is composed of several thylakoid membranes placed on top of one another or they are placed like pancakes in stacks. And in between grana is a fluid filled space known as the stroma. The stroma can be compared to the matrix of the mitochondria. So there you have it. This is the chloroplast and this organelle is responsible for the photosynthetic process. The chloroplast is very similar to the mitochondria in several ways. So the chloroplast again as you could see in this illustration is composed of an outer membrane and an inner membrane and uh, inside the chloroplast are flattened membranes known as thylakoids. The thylakoid membrane contains the green pigment chlorophyll. 
Now, these stylacoid membranes, they are placed on top of one another, forming grana. So, a granum is composed of several stacks of stylacoids. And in between grana is a fluid-filled space known as the stroma. The stroma can be compared to the matrix of the mitochondria. Alright, so at this point, let's watch this short video about light and the chlorophyll pigment. All right, let's watch this. In the chloroplast, the light and dark reactions of photosynthesis occur. The thylakoid discs, which are flattened sacs, contain light-capturing pigments and proteins that carry out the light reactions, which require light to work. In the liquid stroma, the dark reactions occur. They don't have to happen at night, they just don't require light to function. In the membranes of the thylakoid discs are tiny pigment molecules like chlorophyll, which capture energy from light. Chlorophyll A is the most common type, but there's also chlorophyll B. Let's look at how they absorb, reflect, and transmit light. Chlorophyll A absorbs and uses mostly blue light and a little orange and violet. It reflects all of the green light and some of the yellow light. Chlorophyll B absorbs mostly violet light and red light, but also reflects greens and yellows. Because of this, plants with lots of chlorophyll look green, but plants would be wasteful if they had no way to capture some of that green light, and it turns out they do. Carotenoids absorb colors that chlorophyll cannot, so that the plants can capture more energy from light. Notice that the carotenoids have the ability to absorb some of the green light, and they usually have a yellow, orange, red, or brown color. We can see these beautiful colors in the fall when the chlorophyll breaks down and the carotenoids are left behind. To really understand how chlorophyll works and how photosynthesis harnesses the energy from light, we need to know a little bit about light and waves. The peak of the wave is called the crest, and the distance from crest to crest is called the wavelength. The number of waves that pass a certain point per second is called the frequency. Low frequency waves move slow and tend to be larger, and high frequency waves are fast and high energy with short wavelengths. The spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, which includes visible light, has slow, big radio waves on one end, and high energy, high frequency, gamma waves at the other end. Visible light makes up only a tiny portion of the spectrum, but it includes all of the colors we can see, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet or Roy G. Biv. The light towards the red end have lower energy, bigger wavelengths, and a lower frequency. And light toward the violet end has high energy, small wavelengths, and high frequency. When light strikes an electron, the electrons get excited and jump to a higher energy level. Then that excited electron can either be captured by a molecule that's part of a chemical reaction, like in the light reaction in photosynthesis, or the electron will fall down to a lower energy level. When an electron falls to a lower energy level, it emits a photon of light. In this case, the electron has fallen to its ground state, the lowest energy level. Chlorophyll will emit a red light when it falls to a lower energy level. Alright, so before we go into the details of the biochemistry behind photosynthesis, let's take a look now at the stages involved in the photosynthetic reaction. So photosynthesis occurs in two stages. First, we have what we call the light reaction, also known as the light-dependent reaction. Light-dependent because this reaction can only proceed in the presence of sunlight. And we have the dark reaction, also known as the Calvin cycle or the light-independent reaction. Light independent because this reaction can proceed even without the energy from the sun. Alright, so the light reaction occurs in the thylakoid membranes. And in the light reaction, light is needed to produce organic energy molecules such as adenosine triphosphate and NADPH or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate. Now, ATP and NADPH, they will be used to power the dark reaction. The dark reaction occurs in the stroma of the chloroplast and there is no light needed in this reaction. Now, ATP and NADPH is used to power the dark reaction in order to produce energy molecules such as glucose. 
So that's an overview of the two stages involved in photosynthesis. Now here is another diagram showing the chloroplast and the two stages of photosynthesis. Now photosynthesis in the leaves of plants involves many steps but it can be divided into two stages. So again, we have the light dependent reactions or the light reaction and the dark reaction or the Calvin cycle. Now the light dependent reaction or the light reaction takes place in the thylakoid membrane of the chloroplast. And this reaction requires a continuous supply of light energy from the sun. Chlorophyll absorbs this light energy and converts the light energy into chemical energy in the form of ATP and NADPH. Now ATP and NADPH will be used to power the dark reaction or the Calvin cycle. And also as a result of the reaction, oxygen is released as a waste gas. Now, in the stroma of the chloroplast, the Calvin cycle or the dark reaction occurs. The Calvin cycle, also called the light independent reaction, again takes place in the stroma and does not require light energy. Instead, the Calvin cycle uses the ATP and the NADPH from the light reaction in order to produce sugar in the form of glucose. So that is the overview of the light reaction and the dark reactions of photosynthesis. Alright, so let us now go into the details of the light reaction or the light dependent reaction. And again, like what I mentioned, the light dependent reaction occurs in the thylakoid membrane of the chloroplast. Now, in the chloroplast, there are structures embedded called photosystems. Now, what is a photosystem? Now, a photosystem involves the arrangement of the chlorophyll molecules and other pigment molecules packed into the thylakoid membrane. Now, in a photosystem, we have the following. So first, we have what we call a reaction center. The reaction center is basically chlorophyll A. And surrounding the reaction center are the other pigment molecules, chlorophyll B and chlorophyll C. Alright, so that's a photosystem. A photosystem involves the arrangement of chlorophyll molecules so we have the reaction center which is chlorophyll A and surrounding the uh, reaction center are the other pigment molecules chlorophyll B and chlorophyll C. There are two photosystems embedded in the thylakoid membrane. We have photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. They differ in their reaction centers. Now, in photosystem 1, the reaction center is chlorophyll A that can absorb light energy up to 700 nanometers. That's why the reaction center is known as P700 in photosystem 1. Whereas in photosystem 2, the reaction center is chlorophyll A that can absorb light energy from the sun up to 680 nanometers. Hence, in photosystem 2, the reaction center is known as P680 that can absorb light energy from the sun up to 680 nanometers. Now, I hope you would realize that a photosystem is nothing more than a solar collector. A photosystem is composed of arrangements of chlorophyll molecules with a reaction center. The reaction center is basically chlorophyll A. And surrounding the chlorophyll A reaction center are the other pigment molecules chlorophyll B and chlorophyll C. So the question is, what happens in a photosystem? How does the photosystem collects or gathers light? Now we know that light is composed of packets of energy called photons. 
photons of light strikes the pigment molecules chlorophyll B and chlorophyll C. And the energy of the photons, they are transferred from one pigment molecule to the next pigment molecule until they reach the reaction center, which is chlorophyll A. Once the energy from the photons reaches chlorophyll A reaction center, the electrons of the chlorophyll molecule absorbs that energy and the electrons, they get excited or they get energized. Once the electrons, they get energized or excited, they jump to a higher energy level. So this is what we call photo excitation. The energized or the excited electrons are then picked up by a primary acceptor molecule. So isn't that fascinating that a photosystem acts like a dish antenna? So the dish antenna collects radio waves from let's say a satellite and these radio waves are then focused on a central antenna so a photosystem acts in a similar manner so here is an animation you could see the smiley face that smiley face represents radio waves so the radio waves are then received by the dish antenna and the dish antenna focuses all of the radio signals from a central antenna so a photosystem also acts in a similar manner so isn't that fascinating indeed all right so let's take a look now at what happens in a photosystem all right so everybody kindly zoom in on this animated illustration of a photosystem so again, a photosystem is composed of this arrangement of pigment molecules. So at the center, we have the reaction center. The reaction center is chlorophyll A. And surrounding the reaction center are the other pigment molecules, chlorophyll B and chlorophyll C. And also you could see that smiley face, that smiley face represents photons of light. So what happens here is that photons would strike or would hit the pigment molecules chlorophyll B and chlorophyll C. The energy from the photons is then transferred from one pigment molecule to the next pigment molecule and to the next pigment molecule until all of the energy from the photons reaches the reaction center chlorophyll A. Then the electrons of chlorophyll A, they would get excited or energized and the energized electrons, they would jump to a higher energy level wherein they are picked up by an electron acceptor molecule. So that's what happens in a photosystem. So there you have it. I hope everything is clear about what a photosystem is and its role in the light reaction of photosynthesis. So at this point, let us now study in detail what really happens during the light reaction of photosynthesis. So let us begin with photosystem 2. And again, these two photosystems, photosystem 2 and photosystem 1, are embedded in the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast. Now, we have here photosystem 2 with the reaction center P680. So again, that means that the chlorophyll A in photosystem 2 can absorb light energy from the sun up to 680 nanometers. So again, we have here the smiley face. That smiley face represents photons of light. So photons would hit the pigment molecules chlorophyll B and chlorophyll C. And all the energy of the photons will be transferred from one pigment molecule to the next pigment molecule until all the energy reaches chlorophyll A, P680. The electrons of P680, they would get uh, excited and the uh, excited electrons they would eventually jump to a higher energy level until they are picked up by an electron acceptor molecule. In this case, we have pheophytin. 
Now, phaeophytin will transfer the energized electrons through a series of enzymes in the electron transport chain. So, we have the enzymes plastoquinone, PQ, and plastocyanin, PC. So, here in the electron transport chain, as the electron smooths down the chain, energy is released. And again, there is redox here. So, plastoquinone receives the electron. So, plastoquinone is reduced while phaeophytin gets oxidized. Then, plastoquinone transfers the energized electron to plastocyanin. Plastocyanin is reduced while plastoquinone is oxidized. This redox reaction produces energy that is used to phosphorylate ADP and phosphate producing ATP. So eventually, the electrons from plastocyanin in the electron transport chain reaches the reaction center P700 of photosystem 1. And just like in photosystem 2, photosystem 1 receives the energy from photons, the energy from the photons are then transferred from one pigment molecule to the next pigment molecule until all the energy reaches P700 of photosystem 1. The electrons of P700, they get excited or energized and eventually the energized electrons, they are raised to a higher energy level wherein the energized electrons are picked up by an electron acceptor molecule, in this case, ferredoxin. Ferredoxin then eventually reacts with NADP. NADP is reduced to NADPH while ferredoxin is oxidized. So if you will notice in this reaction, we have two products. We have ATP and NADPH. Now, ATP and NADPH will be used to power the dark reaction or the Calvin cycle. And if you will notice also, the reaction is non-cyclic. So, we started with photosystem 2. Then we have phaeophytin. Then the energized electrons reaches the electron transport chain. Then photosystem 1. Then ferredoxin. Then NADPH. So, this reaction is sometimes called non-cyclic photophosphorylation. Now, let's rewind a bit and let's go back to photosystem 2. Now, if you will recall, in photosystem 2, the energy from the photons reaches the reaction center P680. The energy from those photons eventually energizes the electrons of P680. The energized electrons would uh, be raised or they would jump to a higher energy level until they are picked up by phaeophytin. Now, this raising or jumping of the electrons from P680 will create a molecular vacancy in P680. Now, in this case, water comes into the picture. Now, that water comes from the soil that was absorbed by the plants via the roots and up to the stem and to the leaves. Now, there is an enzyme that will split the water into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen will fill that molecular vacancy so that more hydrogen, more electrons would be raised to a higher energy level. So, the reaction would be continuous and oxygen is released as a waste gas. This splitting of water into hydrogen and oxygen is known as photolysis. So again, this is what we call non-cyclic photophosphorylation. Plants and cyanobacteria utilize two photosystems which work sequentially to produce both energy and reducing power. First, a photon of light ejects a high-energy electron from photosystem 2. The electron lost from photosystem 2 does not return to photosystem 2 but is replaced by an electron generated from the splitting of water and the production of oxygen. The electron then travels from the excited reaction center of photosystem 2 to plastoquinone to the B6F complex to plastocyanin and finally to the reaction center of photosystem 1.
This electron transport system generates a proton motive force that is used to produce ATP. Since the excited electron does not return to photosystem 2, this mechanism for making ATP is called non-cyclic photophosphorylation. When photosystem 1 absorbs a photon of light, it ejects a high-energy electron. The energy from this light absorption is used to generate reducing power in the form of NADPH. The ejected electron is replaced by an electron from photosystem 2. Well, I hope everything now is clear about non-cyclic photophosphorylation. Now, to help you better understand non-cyclic photophosphorylation, let's try now to enumerate the steps involved in non-cyclic photophosphorylation. Alright, so in step number one, a photon is absorbed by photosystem 2. So in non-cyclic, we begin with photosystem 2. All the energy from the photons is directed to the reaction center, which is chlorophyll A, P680. Then in step number 2, the electrons from the reaction center are then energized and they are raised from a low energy state to a high energy state so they get energized and they jump to a higher energy level then in step number three these energized electrons are then picked up by an electron acceptor molecule so in this case we have pheophytin then eventually pheophytin transfers the energized electrons to the electron transport chain so we have the enzymes plastoquinone and plastocyanin in the electron transport chain all right then in the next step step number four all the electrons travel down the electron transport chain again uh, by passing through the enzymes plastoquinone and plastocyanin so these enzymes undergo redox and eventually energy is released in order to phosphorylate ADP and that's how ATP is generated in the electron transport chain. Then in step number 5, the excited electrons in photosystem 2 created a molecular vacancy. And like what I have mentioned, there would be the splitting of water by an enzyme into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen fills up the molecular vacancy so that the process would continue and oxygen is released as a waste gas. So this process of splitting water is known as photolysis. And in step number six, the electrons eventually reaches photosystem one, P700, where it waits until the electrons is excited by photons of light. Then in step number seven, the final fate of the electron is the conversion of NADP to NADPH. So in the non-cyclic photophosphorylation process, you have ATP, and NADPH as the products of the reaction. ATP and NADPH would be needed to drive the dark reaction or the Calvin cycle. Within the chloroplast are small disc-like structures called thylakoids, which are surrounded by a fluid-filled space called the stroma. The reactions that synthesize glucose, the Calvin cycle, occur in the stroma. The light-dependent reactions occur in the thylakoid. It is here that conversion of light energy to chemical energy is initiated. In most photosynthetic organisms, thylakoids contain pairs of photosystems, called photosystem 1 and photosystem 2, that work in tandem to produce the energy that will later be used in the stroma to manufacture sugars. 
The photosystems of the thylakoid consist of a network of accessory pigment molecules and chlorophyll, the molecules that absorb the photons of light. Within the pigment molecules, the absorbed light energy excites electrons to a higher state. Photosystems will channel the excitation energy gathered by the pigment molecules to a reaction center chlorophyll molecule, which will then pass the electrons to a series of proteins located on the thylakoid membrane. Photons of light strike photosystems 1 and 2 simultaneously. We will examine what happens with the photons striking photosystem 2 first. The energized electrons are passed from the reaction center of photosystem 2 to an electron transport chain. The electrons lost by photosystem 2 are replaced by a process called photolysis which involves the oxidation of a water molecule producing free electrons and oxygen gas. While this oxygen gas is a byproduct of photosynthesis, it is an important input to the cellular respiration pathways. As electrons pass through the electron transport chain, the energy from the electron is used to pump hydrogen ions from the stroma to the thylakoid creating a concentration gradient. This gradient powers a protein called ATP synthase, which phosphorylates ADP to form ATP. The low energy electrons leaving photosystem 2 are shuttled to photosystem 1. Within photosystem 1, low energy electrons are re-energized and are passed through an electron transport chain where they are used to reduce the electron carrier NADP plus to NADPH. When the chloroplast is receiving a steady supply of photons, NADPH and ATP molecules are rapidly being provided to the metabolic pathways in the stroma. Therefore, the ATP and NADPH formed during the light-dependent reactions are used in the stroma to fuel the Calvin cycle reactions. Well, I guess that's about it for non-cyclic photophosphorylation. Again, the products of non-cyclic photophosphorylation includes ATP and NADPH. And again, as mentioned in the video, ATP and NADPH, it would be used to drive the dark reaction or the Calvin cycle. But wait, there is more. Now, the ATP generated by non-cyclic photophosphorylation is not enough to power the Calvin cycle. So what happens here is that some of the electrons from ferredoxin goes back to the electron transport chain. So some of the electrons from ferredoxin enters uh, plastoquinone. So plastoquinone is reduced while ferredoxin is oxidized. And then the energized electrons would go down the electron transport chain again. So you will notice that from P700 to ferredoxin, some of the electron from ferredoxin goes back to the electron transport chain and back again to photosystem 1 P700. So again, if you will notice, this is a cyclic process. So this will generate more ATP to power the Calvin cycle. This is what we call a cyclic photophosphorylation. So the electrons from paradoxin goes back to the electron transport chain generating more ATP and reaches photosystem 1 again. Alright, so that's the light reaction. The light reaction includes non-cyclic and cyclic photophosphorylation. So I hope you have learned a lot about light reaction of photosynthesis. In our next video, we will study the Calvin cycle. So see you and stay safe.